Would you turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 116? 116, remain standing please as we read the scripture. Psalms 116 is projected on the screen. It comes from the New Living Translation and I'm going to read verses 1 through verse 14. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death, and he saved me. Let my soul be at rest again. For the Lord has been good to me. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. I believe in you. So I said, I am deeply troubled, Lord. In my anxiety, I cried out to you. These people are all liars. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. This is the word of God. Thank you to God. Please be seated. I want to speak for a minute on the topic, what shall I render? The psalm that claims our attention this morning is among the psalms that comprise of that section of the book of Psalms called the Hallel Psalms. The word Hallel is short for Hallelujah. And what it simply means is to praise. And so this Psalm, Psalm 116, is in a group beginning with Psalms 113 and ending with Psalm 118 that were sung throughout the year as part of the Jewish worship ritual. And they took special significance at Passover, since at Passover, that was a time to reflect back to the Lord's deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt. This psalm that claims our attention is one of the personal testimonies. And the person whose testimony it is, is unnamed and unknown. What we know about this person, this writer, is disclosed for us in the content of the song that was read. So we know that this is a person who has faced difficulties and who has probably looked into the very face of death during some low season in his life. He pins the words of Psalms 116 as a testimony. And in this testimony, he declares that I prayed to the Lord at my lowest point in life. In my darkest days, I prayed to the Lord when the pain was unbearable and the Lord delivered me. This is his testimony. And as I read and reflected on this psalm, that's the testimony of some people that's sitting in front of me right now. And I know there are some personal testimonies among us that he's not the only one whom the Lord delivered at a rough place in life. Y'all got some testimonies about how the Lord delivers. You were facing impossible odds. You had nowhere to turn, no one to help, and you turned 
to prayer. God heard your prayer. And you're sitting here today. Because God has brought you through. Have I got any witnesses in here this morning? The testimony is really a praise offered to God. And it's offered in the worship setting. As this person reflected on his relationship with God. And that's in part what worship is all about. That's why you can worship anyway. You can lay on your bed at home. On your seemingly postopedic mattress. In the comfort of your own home. And reflect back within you when you didn't have a window or a pot. God answered your prayers way back then. He knew what you needed. He heard your prayers and he opened doors of opportunity. He blessed you by answering yes to your prayers. He answered yes long enough for you to show up this morning. Blessed as you are. Y'all, we need to remember how God has brought us. That's part of the worship experience. Remembering how God has brought us. Sometimes we forget. You get to the point in your life, now you are CEO. <laughs> if you forget, you walk around with your head up in the air. Nose up in the air. Not remembering that if it were not for the Lord, you wouldn't be where you are right now. It's a time to reflect. Reflection keeps us humble. Remembering where we came from, this man is reflected in this song. It's a testimony. It's, you know, he's, he's reflecting on how God has brought him, reflecting on his journey with God. We're reminded how God has blessed us from the earliest of our existence to this present day. It's acknowledging all that God has done for us in our past and what he's doing for us in our present. And because you belong to God, whatever you're going through this morning, I want you to know right now, it's for your good and ultimately for his glory. So you can give God some praise right now. As we move through the text, we consider the first couple of verses before we get to verse 12. I want to make three points about the test, text and I'm, I'm finished. First, let's consider this worshiper's reflection. Look at how he opens the song, the first four words of the song. It frames the song. It sets, a, it sets the tone and tenor for what else will be said in the song. But before he says anything, he wants, to, he wants the reader to know, I love the Lord. Amen. I love Yahweh. Amen. This reflection is born out of relationship with the living God. This statement is not for him, uh, it's not simply for public consumption. This statement of love for Yahweh is not a flippant, impulsive reaction. He didn't say it so other people can hear it. You know, we hear it all the time. If somebody asks you if you love the Lord, you will say yes without thinking about it. Well, in this text, this declaration comes from a moment of introspection. Amen. He, this is the conclusion that he has made after serious introspection as he carefully and prayerfully contemplates his walk with Yahweh in the past. He said, oh yeah, I love the Lord. I, I, I love the Lord. He's declaring that Yahweh is the object of his devotion. Who is the object of your devotion this morning? The first time we hear this word love, the first time, so... So I'm looking at the word love and, and it's the, I love the Lord. I want to know what that love means, right? So, so you know in the Greek word, the word love, there are four different words for the word love, right? Yes. And it's brotherly love, it's family love, you know, it's, it's romantic love, and then it's agape. So in the Greek 
one word for love doesn't satisfy all that love means. So this is Hebrew Bible, right? So I want to know what love means to the Hebrew. And so I want to find out where is the first where is the first time in the Old Testament that this word for love is used? Are you interested? Yes. It's used of God in Exodus 20 verse 6. When God tells Israel the Ten Commandments, he says, love the Lord your God with all, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. Right. Then he says, you shall not make any images of God. You shall not make any idols of God. You shall not bow down to any God. Then when he gets down to verse 3, verse 6, he says that I will love you and I will bless those who love me. It's the first time. So this is what God is saying. This is what he's saying. He's saying, God, of all the people and things in this world, I love you best. That there is nothing that exceeds my love for you. And my love for you is demonstrated in my obedience to your commands. Y'all not listening to this. Because see, love always includes giving. Amen. 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 You can't tell me that you love me. Amen. If you, and I'm not necessarily talking about material, but if you love me, you ought to at least give me some time, some affection. You ought to at least give me some consideration. If you're in the relationship and you're the only one that's doing all the giving, you need to reconsider that relationship because love always gives. He says, I love the Lord. And this is not just emotion. This is born out of a relationship with the living God. And relationship involves interaction. It involves communication, sensitivity to the feelings of other. Relationship with God is to agree to participate in the covenant that he made with himself to love you. Oh my God. Amen. It means to love God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. It means to please God and to obey God. This kind of relationship makes room for greater revelation of God. Yeah. Now, this is what I mean by that. Those of you who've been walking with God seriously, I'm not talking about church, church goers, because not every church goer has a relationship with God. I'm talking about you who have been in relationship with God 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years and more. The longer you walk with God, the more he shows himself to you. Have I got a witness in here? The more you walk with God, the more he shows himself to you. He, you interact with God by the power of his spirit. He shows you who he is. Through your word, through the word of God, he shows you who he is. And through the fellowship with other saints, God discloses himself. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? God reveals more of himself to you because he has redeemed you. And he wants you to know him in a personal way. This writer says, I love the Lord. And he didn't know it except by... Revelation, but we find in 1 John chapter 4, 19, the writer there explains that if you love indeed, if you indeed love, the only reason you're capable of loving and the only reason you are willing to love is because God loved you first. We love God because God loved us. This first verse is a declaration of the psalmist's devotion to God. He says, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. How many of you love God this morning? Amen. And then he gives the reason why the love of God is in his heart. He says, Look, I love the Lord because he hears my voice. That's what it says in the end, New Living Translation. That's why I want to use it. Because he hears my voice. And listen, this is how personal it is. He hears my voice. Amen? 
Notice he personalizes it. I don't know how many people are calling upon the name of the Lord. I don't know how many people are making their requests known to God, how many people are praying to God at any one time. There might be millions of people calling on the name of the Lord. Some of those people who are calling on the name of the Lord at the same time I am are in worse condition than I'm in. Some are in critical condition, but this psalmist says the reason I love the Lord is because he has demonstrated in my life that he hears my voice. Y'all like y'all yeah. That when I call upon him, regardless of how many other millions of people are calling upon him, when I call upon him, I know that the Lord hears. He hears my voice. That's, that's personal, y'all. That's, that's personal. Okay, okay. Okay. So, you know, the, the recognition, voice recognition, the reason you can recognize voice, it comes out of human recognize, recognition, is it comes out of relationship. Yeah. So parents can walk in a room that's filled with children and you can distinguish the sound of your child's voice. Yeah. And the reason you can distinguish the, child, the sound of your child's voice is because the close relationship, the bonding between the two of you. So you are in tune with your child's voice. Amen. So, so this morning I used the illustration. Um, when I was little, we lived in the row houses. Y'all know what the row houses are? Mm -hmm. The the row condominiums, right? <laughs> public public condominiums. We lived in the public condominiums, and uh, it's side by side, you see. And in front, in front of, uh, I say, uh, 50 yards in front of me was a second roll of condominiums. And between us, there was a field of grass. It was grass when they laid it, but since they didn't prepare any play areas for the kids who lived in the condominiums, we had to play on the grass until it was dust. <laughs> and we'd be out there playing at, at just before sundown, we'd be playing kick the can. <laughs> we'd be playing dodgeball. We'd be playing crack the whip, football. And mom would say, Derek, it's time to come in. And even though there are two or three or four or five Derek's that's out on the field, because I am in relationship with my mother, when she says, Derek, I know exactly who she talking to. None of the era, other Derricks make a beeline for home, but this Derrick did at the response of his mother's voice. If you flip that around, the reason God knows your voice is because of your relationship with him. And when all of the other people that he has created, when all of the other people on the planet, when all of the other people calling in all of the other languages among humankind, when you call on the Lord, he hears your voice. Y'all, I'm trying to help you this morning. That's personal. The Lord knows my name. I love him because he hears my voice. And not only does he hear my voice, listen to what he says. He says, he hears my prayer for mercy. Not only does he hear my voice, he recognizes my voice, he responds to me as an individual, the God of creation, who flung the stars into the skies, called the sun to being, scooped out the oceans with his hands, called forth the mountain, the God of heaven, hears my cries, and my prayers for mercy. Now this, my brothers and sisters, has legal implications in the text because he means he's guilty of something and deserves to be punished. He knows he needs to reap what he has sown, but mercy is divine intervention on our behalf and the love and compassion of God prevents you from getting what you deserve. You know, and I thought, you know, when I, when I thought about it, I thought you would be shouting by now. <laughs> and the reason I thought you'd be shouting is because you know you're guilty. 
Amen. 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 That's I have. Let me. Can I tell you? You look innocent. <laughs> you got on your Sunday clothes and you got on your Sunday face and your Sunday disposition. Amen. But you ain't innocent. And listen, listen, listen. The person sitting right next to you might have no idea about your infraction. But God knows, and you know, and thank God for his mercy. Because if it had not been for the mercy of God, we, you and I, everybody in the room would have been taken out a long time ago. So why don't you help me give God some praise for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for not giving me what I deserve. Thank God for divine intervention. Thank God. Thank God for his mercy. Amen. Amen. There have been some times in your life when because of your own misdoing, you know what you decided to do was wrong because you got the Holy Ghost living in you. And he told you and you heard him and you did it anyway. Amen. And because of your decision, you are now in a difficult place. Amen. And it is the mercy of God that reaches down and lifts you out. And then, you know, trouble just comes sometimes, doesn't it? You don't have to do anything. You could be doing what you're supposed to do and then trouble just come your way, press your back against the wall. You know, it is mercy that lifts us out. When I know I have messed up and my own conscience condemns me, when people find me guilty and judge me, even then, when we ask for mercy, God gives us mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. The psalmist says, I love the Lord. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I love the Lord because he heard my cry and my prayers for mercy. Notice that as you move through this, you notice that with each line, the psalmist is talking about a more intimate relationship with God. He says, he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Then he says, he bends down to listen. <laughs> I'm killing me. <laughs> to think that God bends down to listen to me. That, you know, he, he bends down to listen. This suggests that no matter how low in life you might sink, you are never too low that God is not willing to bend down and hear your voice. So you could be walking down the street and a person whose appearance and social standing might be offensive to you, even as a Christian. Y'all know what I mean? Just, just offensive. You know, you look, you don't know nothing about this individual except they are offensive. They are offensive to the eye. They are offensive to the senses, but you're a Christian. And so this person makes a request of you. He calls on you for something. And you might give it, but you would give it at arm's distance, at arm's length. You will not bend down. This text suggests that even when you and I were in a mess, that even when you and I were in a, in a mess, even when we might have been in the hog pens of life, even when we were ceremonially unclean, our Lord and our God bends down to listen to those who are in relationship with him. The psalmist, because of the intimate relationship with God, because of God's demonstration of the willingness to get near, because he has heard my prayers and has had mercy on me, the psalmist said, for this reason, as long as I have breath, I will pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, you know, the, the, the first service, they, they were with me so such that I want to sing this little part, but y'all ain't with me. I don't know where you're at. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. 
I can remember in the old church, I remember the old church. Anybody, anybody who went to church as a, as a kid, a youngster, and you're not young now, I ain't talking to you. <laughs> you remember the old deacons? You remember, you remember when deacons used to do the devotion? We didn't have prayer, we didn't have prayer team. We had deacons. Yeah, anybody remember when deacons used to do the de Okay, six of y'all. <laughs> Deacons did the devotion. One might lead off with a with a knockoff of Psalm 116. Y'all remember that? He'd get on one knee and say, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. And then the congregation come out. that I really wanted to get to this morning. And it begins with verse 12. And there, after, after giving verses 3 through uh, 11, all that he has been through, all that he has experienced, you know, you know facing death and the people lying on him, after all of that, he shows up at worship. And in the worship experience, he has one question. What can I offer the Lord for all he's done for me? That's the question that he had. What can I offer the Lord because for what all he's, because of his relationship with God, because he acknowledges all the benefits that God has poured out into his life, he's wanting to give God something. And He's saying, I must, what I must give God something as an expression of my love and commitment to him. Then he says, I will lift the cup of salvation. And this cup he lifts to accept whatever blessing God has for him. And then he says, I will praise the Lord's name for saving me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here's, worship is not primarily about getting something out of it. <coughs> Now you should leave better than you came in. Amen. But it's not primarily about getting something out of it. Worship can't be a time for entertainment. Amen. So that if your favorite choir is not singing, you can't get anything out of it. If your favorite preacher is not preaching, you can't get anything out of it. Worship primarily is coming in to give something to God for all the blessings that he has poured out on your life. Come on, come on now. He woke you up this morning. Now, before he woke you up this morning, he's given you from Sunday to Sunday. He's blessed you every day of your life. He has provided all that you need. He has protected you from danger seen and unseen. He's given you resources to live on. He's given you strength. He has put you together. He has blessed your life. He has healed your body. He's kept your family together. He's kept you from going crazy. And you showed up on Sunday morning because he woke you up in the morning and gave you passage to church. And when you get to the sanctuary, you ought to be ready to give God something. Hallelujah. You ought to be ready to give God something. Now, God doesn't need us. 
stuff. No, he doesn't need our stuff. We don't have any material possession to give God. The psalmist said the earth is already the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Everything you have, God gave it to you. Even your tithe. When you bring your tithe, you're not giving to the God. That's not an opportunity to give to God. That's giving back what he has already given you. And so he says, when I come in, I will give praise and thanksgiving. Yes. God, that's what worship is about. To give God praise and thanksgiving for what he's done. Yes. Look back at your life. See how he blessed you. And then praise his name for what he's done. We can give God praise and thanksgiving for all the goodness he's done for us. Listen, this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 13. So just in case, you know, some of you, you know, you think that the Old Testament is for old times. That's why you don't tithe, right? You don't tithe. It's Old Testament. So, you know, for you, you don't believe in the Old Testament. So Psalms 116 is for you. So let's look at he <laughs> Let's look at Hebrews 1350. That's New Testament, right? Here, this is what it says. This is what it says. Therefore, by Jesus. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That's New Testament, isn't it? Let us, how often, continually offer sacrifices of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know what? You know what? I, you know, I, get, I get a little uh, frustrated when I have to pump Christians up to give praises to God. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, get, I get a little frustrated. I get a little frustrated, but I've been around for a long while, and I know, I know how you are. But, you know, but, you know, I wonder why the choir have to pump you up to pray. Why do you need a praise team to pump you up to pray? Why, why do you need chords to pump you up to pray when God has been so good to you? You, 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 know, you just ought to have praise on your lips. You, you ought to have thanksgiving in your heart. That's why it says, let the redeemed of the Lord. Come on, say so. If God has been good to you, you ought to say so. If God has blessed your life, you ought to say so. If God has provided for all you want to say so? Is there anybody here this morning that's not too mean? You're not too arrogant. You're not too prideful. You are not too tired. Just to stand up on your feet and give God. Give Him. Give Him your family best friend. And I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. If you continue reading, he says, I'm going to pay my vow. I'm going to keep my promise in the presence of your people. So even then, there were some people sitting around saying, it don't take all that. You ain't got to run around the sanctuary. You, you ain't got to do no dance and jump up and down. And th you ain't got to go through all that. But this is what the psalmist says. I'm sorry if you are offended. <laughs>